and ballot system, talking about the design approaches, the design goals, and some of the design abstracts level. Okay, starting from the requirements, specifications, the architectures, the components, and system integration. Okay, so if, if we are doing a software development, okay, we usually follow a, a model how to go about doing our, our writing of software codes. So the model that we are looking at here is called the waterfall and spiral. Okay? So this is the two software model, development models that uh, we have been talking in class. Okay? Uh, okay. And the question is to ask you why is the spiral development model an improvement over the waterfall model? Why? What? Sorry, they didn't say that. Why is the question? Why? Why the spiral? Spiral is the one that is referring to here on your right hand oh, side. Okay, it started from. Have you seen this before in class? Why, why, why not see it before in, in class? Uh, in the class notes, I, I've covered this. You have seen it, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Why flexible? Because waterfall, you must wait for one, one step to finish it and move on to the next. Okay, actually, the spiral encompasses the waterfall. If you see this spiral diagram, it's a three dimensional diagram. It started from the very refined, very early version of the design, the very first version, beta version, or whatever you call it. Okay? During that version, you do a sim simplified. Let's say you want to do a simple MP3 program, <coughs> code program. You do a simplified version. So you're looking at requirement, architecture, and coding. Basically, this part, requirement, architecture, and coding. Okay, so the spiral itself is a three-dimensional model. It encompasses the waterfall. Okay, so maybe in some way you are right to say that it's more flexible. Uh, but this is also for bigger projects, bigger software projects that demands uh, 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 this approach, bottom-up approach. Okay, so as you go to the next version, you want to increase more features. You again look at the requirement, the architecture, and the coding, and build up from there. Okay, so spiral is a bottom-up approach that allows a system to be refined over several iteration. It's used for some complex system or software design, uh, and a higher level representing represent a better version or the more advanced version. Okay? So that is the a very simplified explanation. Uh, and it, and it, this course, I think that is enough. The intro part of it, that's enough. Okay? We are not going into the detail that, uh, because if you look at some of the textbook, they come up with very fine explanations and detailed explanations, which I do not think is necessary. Okay, I will stop at this layer of the distinction between a waterfall, which is top down, and a spiral, which is bottom up. Okay, so uh, I think there are bet we better spend more time talking about the hardware and the software later on. Okay, so this is the questions that basically cover the part that I mentioned of software development models. So, is there any questions? It's just the steps. The first step is the requirement, okay, the basic idea for the waterfall is going from here, is from the abstract to the details, or to the completion, okay, well the spiral itself is like at every layer, every version, you have, uh, you look into the architectures, maintenance, or oh, sorry, requirements, as well as code. Let me move 
on to the next questions. Okay. Question two. What are the important characteristics of a software design methodologies? What are the important characteristics when you are talking about software design methodologies? some of the things that you need to be focused on when you're designing a software. Anyone? When you're writing a software, what is the most important concern? When you write a code itself, I know in the past, when you're writing a code for micro P, you simply run through the code, compile it, make sure it runs. Uh, you input some value, make sure the output is correct. This functional test. But for embedded system, if you have a software that built on inside the hub processor itself, you have to consider other things besides running correctly. Hardware limitations. Okay, hardware means what? The software itself cannot be too long because of limited memory. <coughs> memory. memory. Alright, because you are building embedded system, it's not building a PC. You have limited constraint, we know about that. Okay, so when you, you program your software itself, yes, you are right that you need to be of mindful that you have a memory uh, limitation. So, so that you are, uh, you cannot write too long, okay? Uh, then when you compile, you see how much of memory it takes to save your codes into the internal memory. So we will come to the memory part in the following lectures. But right now, something to take notes. What other things when you write a software for embedded system? That's why right, important characteristic or important yardstick, you want to call it. <coughs> Sometimes the processor is not fast enough to run one by one, so you must break into a small subgroup. So, your <coughs> software codes must be optimized. Or you have, because you know the word optimize, all right? How fast the software runs. Okay, let's say you are, you have tons of, you, your, your processor is running very fast. Huh? You, you do not need to care about time it takes to end, to complete a job. Let's say in PC. So you, you, can, you can just write your code in, in very high level language, like MATLAB, like C. It will take longer time to complete. But in a real real time system, the performance the, the performance is very critical. You have to finish a job within a certain period of time, so you have to find ways to run your code faster. If you cannot run the code in C to do it, what you need to do sometimes you have to go for low level. Low level means assembly codes to run it more efficiently. Okay, there, so that's why in the in the future course we'll tell you what are the tricks people use to run the code faster. Sometimes by putting the program A and program B in different memory, you can have a, some sort of parallel access. You run faster as well. So there are different tricks people use. But now you know the, the very fundamental, the very uh, abstract level that you need to make sure your code runs fast enough to you say meet the resources of your embedded systems. Resources referring to your processor speed. You cannot use a super duper processor in a simple embedded system. It's too costly. It consumes too much power. Okay? So when we talk about good, so when we talk about software design, we want to make sure the performance, performance referring to the how fast this code is running. In the past, when you write a program, you never tell, you never really do a benchmarking or profiling. How, how long your code, your, your, your instruction A, B, C, you, you run it, you, you basically don't care how long it takes to run. Now you, you have to put some breakpoint, and then you have a timer, time to zero, 
and time to what? To finish running this tree instruction. Okay? So it's also... Uh, so for your MyRail project later on, I will want you to also look into this. When you write your code, or your, it's, it's graphical, I know it's high level, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to look for ways where you can tell me how long your code is going to run. How fast? All right, it may, it may run 10, 10 seconds. Your, your friend may only run 3 seconds, doing the same thing. Depends how, how, you, how you program it. Okay? So, uh, so that's all these programming tricks. And then one more thing to take note is energy. Why? Why energy is important? <coughs> to save energy. Yeah, especially powered by battery. Equip, uh, those devices are powered by battery. Energy. So, you see, instruction A, B, C, uh, they may, they, there's another benchmarking. They benchmark against the power consumption. You run this three instruction, it may take up a few micro watts of power consumption. But if you change this instruction a bit by making sure that they assess the data internally in the processor, you may reduce the power consumption or energy consumption to uh, maybe one tenth of a micro watt. Okay, so different instruction will also incur different amount of energy. Okay, maybe I just illustrate simply. Let's say you got CPU and you have a memory external, and then you have an internal memory. So if you can access data from internal memory, you will consume less power than, cons than taking data from the external memory. They have lots of study. Even you buy a processor itself, you can look at their application notes. They'll tell you, okay, the instruction is the same. Let's say this instruction A is accessing external memory. You have another instruction uh, A1. This A1 is accessing internal memory. They both do the same thing, getting something. But in terms of power consumption, it's very much different. Okay? So just a quick link to the energy consumption. Any questions? Okay, what about the hardware? Hardware design. Hardware design is like IC chips. You are, you are designing everything hardwired. Not programmable. ASIC is one form of hardwired. FPGA uh, can be considered hardwired, but we call it uh, reconfigurable. A6 is the one that you cannot program at all. So when you do this stuff, hardware design, what is the main consideration? What are the main considerations? Yeah? Size, yes, yes, size. Because hardware, you want to optimize, make it as small as possible, the size. What else? Huh? Size and weight. Weight, yeah. Uh, weight, yeah. A chip set, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, of course, yeah. It's size and weight, yeah, okay. And what else? Sufficient energy to the IC. Yeah, I think the the so-called uh, you also need to look at the power consumption because because when, when you design a chip a six chip itself, I, I will introduce these chips in the week after the Chinese New Year. Okay, this particular chip itself has an advantage. It can be small size and also consume lesser power compared to the programmable processor. Programmable processor refer to your Intel processor, your DSP, your ARMS, your microcontrollers, FPGA is a concept programmable. Okay? So, when we are talking about hardware, we want to make sure that the performance, <coughs> hardware performance, including speed, power consumption, are uh, what we require. Okay, are uh, what we require. And as well as the area size, area that you mentioned. Okay, very simple. So what about the <laughs> uh, hardware software? Hardware software, I think I gave, a, a, when I finished the last class, last lectures, I give an example. Okay, it, it, example is to build a gadget that can be deployed 
in the environment and that particular gadget consists of two chipset or several processors. Some of them are hardware, some of them are programmable processor. Okay, so when you are dealing with this hardware and software, the important part is the integration. You can test the hardware and software separately, but when they come together, ultimately they have to achieve a certain target. Alright? because they need to interact. This hardware and software need to pass data. They need to communicate among these two. Okay? They need to communicate. So when you communicate, you incur time. Okay? But the whole package need to perform certain jobs within a particular period of time. They need to uh, consume a particular amount of energy so that it can last for seven days without charging, etc. It must be small size to be planted in certain places, and it has to be, uh, the other thing is that to be uh, rugged or weatherproof type of things, depending on where you deploy. Okay? So, so this is just a very quick, you see the answer here is very quick, point form. Okay, so you can write in your own words, just remember the, the key point. So software, the important part is performance and the energy consumption. Hardware is also performance and area size. When we combine the both software method and hardware method together, the integration needs to achieve the overall objective of the embedded system. Any questions on this? This part here, this is where the lectures cover up to here, in the last lectures. So tomorrow, I'm going to cover other things, okay? But this tutorial also cover other parts, so I will have to give you more information. Okay, can I move on? Okay, that's good. Let's move to a question that I want you to help me to answer. Okay. It's a, it's a question that is uh, thrown to you. You can think about it. You are, you are designing a portable media player. I know they're not, not very popular. Huh? In the past, it's portable media player. Just to listen to music or to listen to video or watching video. Okay? That must include a DRM module. What, what does DRM stand for? Dynamic uh, Random Access Memory. No, not, 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 not that acronym. Oh. What DRM stand for? In the past, uh, when Sony came out with some of their portable players, they incur some copyright features. This is called the digital right management. Okay, it's in the lecture notes. The last page of the lecture notes, DRM stand for digital right management. Okay, so it's basically a chipset that allows the player to play authentic song or the, 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 the original copy, not the pirated version. Okay, so they will check if you, you buy, you, if you have downloaded a, a file from the stores, iTunes store, whatever, they have a certain header. So there is a particular chip, a particular process they basically check the haters to see whether that song is is an authentic one. So if you pass it to someone else, okay, then then they will incur certain changes, and then you will notice that you didn't buy the original copy; you buy the pirated copy. Okay, so there is this module. Should you implement this module on a general purpose processor? or a specialized crypto processor? That's the question. So what it means is this, should you use a programmable solution or hardwired solution? Programmable. Pro programmable versus hardwired. Why? Must have why, explain. Because nowadays, okay, even one at a time, please. Okay, you, you, you come first. Even though you program something, mm. uh, people are smart, they still can change. 
can change. So okay. maybe uh, the. So you 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 are saying that you prefer to be in the programmable. Yes. Okay. Why? You mean is able people to change it? Ah, I mean if. Is it good thing? If for example, last time the CD right there, right? CD they couple one uh security something. Mm -hmm. So if you buy a parator one, you cannot play. The mm -hmm. play the player cannot only able to play, mm -hmm. but after that they bring some kind of crack to can play. Yeah, let let's say in the past there's this multi region type of a player. All right, you have D DVD, yeah, DVD. DVD. Here is region three, so you buy a, a D DVD from US. It's region one. You cannot play on the region three players. Okay, but people in Simlim Tower they will do some crack or some ways to so called break it yes. or break uh, break the code so they allow you to play the region one DVD. Yes. So you are saying this programmable is better? If if for example if they trace out these then they can ask them to upgrade the firmware to override the thing. So mm -hmm. if you put hardware hard wire you cannot do that. Okay. So you have some firmware that allows you to do some updating or some patch to prevent uh, so-called piracy, whatever. Okay, this is your point. Okay. Hardwired, yes, you do not have the uh, so-called the options to program. Yes. Sorry? Hardwired. Hardwired, why?